Andrew Malcolm of Investors Business Daily and the Prince of Twitter at AH Malcolm. Thank you very much for being patient while I uh, fixed our little issues here at the Ed Morrissey Show. Um, <laughs> the, what I was trying to do is I wanted to put a picture up on the screen. I'm not going to be able to do it because I don't want to necessarily risk screwing this up a, a second time. Uh, but I, I wanted to put a picture up on the screen. I was going to ask Andrew about this because we, Andrew and I talk about media issues quite a bit. Now, Donald Trump was on Good Morning America this morning. And actually, this was kind of unusual. It's starting to, he's starting to do this now. He's actually showing up for his media appearances. For a long time, he would only call in, right? He never would, he'd never come in in, in person. The last couple of weeks, I've noticed that he's doing a lot more in-person interviews, in-studio interviews for these things, which tells me that maybe he's taking the, the, the challenge from Ben Carson a little bit more seriously than he yeah, has to admit, yeah. right? Because on today, he was like, well, or actually on Good Morning America, I shouldn't say, because there is a show called today. He's on Good Morning America with George Stephanopoulos. He's going, well, Ben Carson doesn't have the experience. He doesn't have the, the temperament to be president, and he wouldn't succeed if he was president, and, and so on and so on. But he was there on set. And so Dylan Byers tweeted this out maybe about half an hour ago. And it shows Laura Spencer from Good Morning America sitting on Donald Trump's lap. Now, she she is the one who put this on her own Instagram account. It's And if you look up Dylan Byers' uh, Twitter account, you see there's Laura Spencer sitting on Donald Trump's lap. And I'm thinking to myself, yeah, nothing says, you know, professionalism and journalism. <laughs> Like sitting on a presidential candidate's lap, especially I would imagine, and I'm not, I'm not a woman in, in the media, obviously, but I would tend to think that that might be even a little bit more so for women who are working in journalism, Andrew. I mean, it's a little odd. I don't, I don't think... It's, yeah, it's very odd. It's very unprofessional um, by the old standards. Now, by celebrity standards, I have to say some of the worst groupies are media people. Uh, and you can see that in Hollywood. But um, you remember, uh, was it four days of the condor, or three days or a week and a half or something? Remember that Robert Redford movie? Yeah, three days of the condor. Yeah, which my yeah, dad three hated. Days, <laughs> three days of the condor, and and the end of the movie is uh, uh, him, uh, Robert Redford, standing on Forty Third Street at Times Square with Cliff Robertson. And just motioning to, he said, well, you know, it's too late. Uh, it's already coming out. And he motions down the street. And down 43rd Street, there was a big digital clock. And over it, it said Times. Well, when they were filming, uh, that's the New York Times, uh, hence Times Square. They're gone from there now. But uh, uh, while they were filming there, Robert Redford came into the newsroom. And if you want to see professional journalists turn into simpering sycophants. I, I, it was just shocking to me. Oh my God, it's Robert Redford. Oh, oh my God. Has anybody got a camera? Oh my God. I mean, it was just disgusting, just disgusting. Um, and, um, I just, I mean, I love the movie, but sorry, when you see the media. So when, uh, when, uh, this uh, uh, ABC woman gets in the presence of Donald Trump. They want to be. Uh, well, I can kind of understand it if you're talking to you know a movie star who's not you know maybe I, I shouldn't actually say that. You yeah. know, one of the things that I did when I first started blogging and I made a specific decision to give it up is get pictures with people that you know that you're covering. You know, because it's very typical. You go to these things and you get pictures taken with whoever the speaker is or the you know and in fact Wait, I, way, I have i have a picture of me with the next president scott walker <laughs> <laughs> well i have a picture of me doing an interview with jeb bush but i didn't pose for the picture it was a picture that was taken while we were doing an interview this was at the, the red state gathering in august but i stopped doing the things where you pose for for pictures with people because i kind of started to think I don't think that's really professional. I mean, it kind of makes it look like you're there. No, as a fan. I agree. I agree. I mean, it, and I don't necessarily begrudge other people. And if they're comfortable with it, that's fine. I wouldn't sit in anybody's lap. <laughs> and, oh, by the way, you and I were at CPAC, right? When Sarah Palin came up and started taking pictures with a, a lot of people. And, and at CPAC, you have people who are just there as voters and activists. Totally a cool thing to get your picture taken with your favorite 
you know, uh, politician. Absolutely cool. But if you're there covering things, you know, I, I just <laughs> I think maybe that there's a little bit of a line there that maybe you shouldn't be looking to be, you know, sort of a fanboy of people and might want to just exercise a little restraint. And that's just anything. You know, it, it, sitting on somebody's lap. <laughs> to do that yeah, right. it just it's strange yeah. it's weird yeah well I've, I've i've run some photo lines at fundraisers and um, you do get a lot of um well I, I wouldn't say well maybe crazy silly requests and um you know you never want the candidate or his wife to have to be the one to say no so i was always the no person you know so can we sit on the couch no it's standing over here by the bookcase. This is where we're doing all the pictures. Um, so uh, there are no pictures that I know of of Laura Bush sitting in any donor's lap. <laughs> 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 yeah, I, At least on my on my watch, they weren't done. <laughs> I wouldn't even know what that would look like. <laughs> I wouldn't even know what yeah, that would really. look like. Yeah, no. So I mean, th this is this is what I'm talking about, though. Is that you have this sort of celebrity atmosphere this sort of game show atmosphere in these debates and it spills over into the coverage and so maybe yeah. it's maybe oh, it's, absolutely maybe absolutely. it's not a good and, idea and and there's also the celebrity coverage of the reporters i mean if you want to see you'll see the groupies and people trying to get carl cameron's autograph while he's at these events and uh, and brit hume i had a friend that uh went out for coffee with brit hume uh not so long ago uh and uh in the course of an hour or an hour and a half coffee, there were six people that came up to interrupt his lunch and their coffee and uh, and have their picture taken with him, get his autograph, or, uh, just to tell him uh, that they, you know, I've watched you for years. Well, you know, what, what are you supposed to say? Well, I guess you say thank you. But when, when the governor uh, that I worked for in Montana, you know, he was two terms. And at the end, he said, uh, uh, you know, uh, term limits, he, he didn't go in liking term limits, but he came out liking term <laughs> limits, and saying, that by, saying, saying that by the end of eight years, you do need some fresh thinking and fresh blood in there. And then as a sort of a sort of voce aside to me, he said, <laughs> and besides, I'd like to have a dinner out with my wife without being interrupted a million times. At the restaurant, you know, and, and for each, for, you know, bless them. They, they like him. So they want to approach him and this, and he's in the yeah. business of wanting to be liked. Right. Right. So, uh, and, and for each one of them, it's only one interruption, but in the course of a dinner, an anniversary celebration or something with your wife, <laughs> and we don't have secret service. Uh, it's like 20 or 25 interruptions. So it's one for each person, but it's 25 for the target. <laughs> and, um, you know, it's, it, it gets old is yeah. what it is, is what, is what it does. And Trump knows how to play this. So he did that. He knows now that's going to go viral. That picture, just like the Donna Rice, Gary Hart picture. You would think, uh, with Donna Rice sitting in Gary Hart's lap on a boat called monkey business, when he was married, that he would have uh, he would have thought of that in advance, but I guess not. I guess not. I guess not. And and I, I, I just it just seems to me to be a strange thing for a reporter be for a reporter to be doing, uh, except for maybe if they're doing it with Hillary Clinton. That's all I'm saying. But at any rate, we're almost <laughs> we're almost to the end of this, and I'm sorry because we took a chunk out of Andrew's. Uh, Andrew's time with us. Yeah, now. really. I should uh, I should take some of that back from Guy P. Benson. Uh, I, I, I'm teasing. I, I'm teasing. I think you should. I think I think what we're going to do is we're going to we're going to start a petition here at the Ed Morrissey Show. I said, you know, restore Andrew's time. Restore Andrew's <laughs> time. That's right. Uh, you're right. Right. Free free speech. <laughs> free the Malcolm. Free the Malcolm. <laughs> there you go. We got to have a hashtag. Hashtag free the Malcolm. That's what we need. Hashtag free the Malcolm. I love it. I love it. But at any rate, before we get to that, we got to anyway, do the so jokes. We got to get the, the jokes here. Yeah. So Jimmy Fallon said that uh, Hillary Clinton uh, celebrated her 68th birthday last week, and she was asked by a reporter, "What was your favorite gift?" And she replied, "Donald Trump." <laughs> <laughs> that that plays into my uh, my 
theory that he's a stalking horse for her, just like uh, Ross Perot was for her husband uh, back in 92. So Conan O'Brien uh, says that the, uh, the doctor, known affectionately as the father of Botox, has died. And his patients are just terribly grief-stricken, but they have no way to show it. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh that that's pretty that's pretty awesome i like that that's one. a good one yeah that's a good one you can use that at the end of the guy segment too so conan o'brien also said that there's a new app out for people who are looking for a new house uh and you can determine with this app if the house has ever been used uh as a meth house and what the app does it just asks you is the house in florida <laughs> Florida man, Florida man returns. <laughs> oh man! Well, I, I guess that's it, Andrew. Other than telling people that they should follow you because you are the prince of Twitter at ah right. and uh, and uh, not only not only should they be following you for that reason, but uh, just because you write at Investors Business Daily Investors dot com slash Andrew Malcolm, which is uh, just fantastic and people who aren't reading you on a regular basis will be beaten severely in the end i'm just warning you folks <laughs> be the first up against the wall come the revolution if yeah, you have not we, been we, we, we know who you are we, we have days we have days to see who's not reading andrew malcolm i'm telling you remember the mel brooks was uh was uh, uh, uh carl reiner was interviewing mel brooks and it and it was uh it was supposed to be an Argentinian rancher, uh, and uh, he said so. He was talking to him about ranching, and every once in a while, Mel Brooks would break out with, "The crust Poland in 10 days' time. <laughs> 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 Carl Reiner says, you know, I, I don't think you're an Argentinian rancher. <laughs> he said, but first, tip you off. Anyway, um, Thank you, Edward, and well, we'll you. see everybody back again here next week, right? Same bat time, same bat channel right here at the Ed Morrissey Show. Thanks again, Andrew, for coming on the show with us. We will talk to you again next week, senor. Okay, goodbye. Now I get to listen to Guy. There okay, you bye. go. Guy Benson now coming up here <laughs> after Andrew Malcolm. I'm going to give Guy a call right now. And uh, Oh, good. Yeah, because that's what I really want to do at this point in time is do an upgrade to Skype in the middle of this show because things have been going so well. Um, uh, no. So let's go ahead and give Guy Benson a call. This is this has been a, a great show for the um, for the production values for the uh, uh, now I can't even think of the name of it. <laughs> Come on, chat room, help me out here. Trying to do three things at once here and doing and failing at all three of them. Open source production values. There you go. Open source production values. Thank you. Guy Benson coming up, of course, from townhall.com, the uh, senior editor, a political editor of townhall.com, a Fox News contributor, and a guy who uh, sometimes answers his phone. <laughs> sometimes, I should say. Sometimes he answers his phone. Sorry, Guy Benson is not available. Record your message. Well, we'll try this again. You know, it's one of those days. It's one of those days, I tell you. What kind of a day is it? The person who's been stalking me on Twitter ever since we kicked her off of, uh, kicked her out of the comment section for trolling, called me boring. <laughs> I'm thinking to myself, hmm, if I'm that boring, why are you stalking me on Twitter all the time? <laughs> uh, yeah. What can I say? We're supposed to leave him a goofy message. Well, maybe we'll do that the next Hello. time. Hello. Hey, Guy Benson. There you are. How are you doing today, sir? Doing well. How are you? I am doing well. We're live on the Ed Morrissey show because I have no producer. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and so it's just me. It's just me. When I call, you're always live, Guy. And that's all right because you are always on as the political editor of townhall.com and uh, contributor at Fox News. Before we get started on the poll, what's coming up for you next on Fox News? We should start with that. Uh, well, Fox Business will be hosting 
the Republican presidential debate next week in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And I'll be heading out there for that, covering it for Town Hall, but also probably doing some pregame analysis on Fox Business and maybe some postgame as well. I'm still up in the air on that. So I will be uh, busy with Fox from D.C. later this week uh, and then joining in Milwaukee next week. Wow. Okay. So there you go. You got a busy, you got a busy uh, November coming up. I think I'm supposed to go out to the, I think I'm supposed to go out to the December Las Vegas debate. So I don't know if you're going to be out there yes. at the same time. So I will, I will be there. Yeah. Yeah. I, I kind of assume. So uh, they're finally letting me out of the cage for a debate. I, I don't know. <laughs> Batting will you down be, the hatches. Are you going to be in Chicago for the uh, WIND event? I have not heard anything about that, but I know WIND, they do great events, by the way. That's our Chicago affiliate, the Salem affiliate in, um, in Chicago. It's uh, 540 a.m., if I remember correctly, right? 560. 560 a.m., uh, and uh, they do great events down there. WIND events are a lot of fun, but I haven't heard anything more about that, so I'll let you know. But, uh, Please for the, do. So for those of you who are in that area, that is going to be, uh, what's the date on that um, event? Oh boy. Uh it's going to be hang on, hang on. Um November fourteenth. Oh yeah, I don't think I'll be <laughs> I don't think I've got the time to do it now. That's that's coming up pretty quick and I haven't heard anything from anybody. But uh November fourteenth. So if you're in the area, November fourteenth, that's a week from Saturday. Um be sure to be sure to check that out. So uh they always have a lot of fun at the W I N D events. Uh so guy, you and I Got a chance to uh, to do the third hot air town hall survey, or as you call it, the town hall hot air survey. And uh, <laughs> what were your what were the big surprises for you this time around? Well, I mean, first of all, I I look at the whole poll with a bit of a jaundiced eye because it's a D plus nineteen sample. Now we didn't really poll any general election stuff or head-to-head stuff that would have skewed everything. Right. So, you know, the polling of Republicans and people likely to vote in the Republican primary versus the Democratic primary, like, I actually think that that's more worthwhile. There are one or two results that we got into um, a little bit farther down in the poll that probably were impacted by the heavily, heavily Democratic tilt uh, yeah. of the sample. We can probably get into that. Well, let's, but in let's, terms let's, of yeah, we can talk about the methodology. I mean, I'm I'm happy to discuss this. I, I'm I'm sort of the point person for these polls. Survey Monkey is has got a 45 million person database, and what you do is you buy a number of uh, responses that that are qualifying responses. So for us, qualifying responses are a registered voters, and B, complete responses to our polls. So they have to answer every question. And that gets sent out in a random manner across the entire, across our entire database. And basically, I think the first X number of people who respond to this poll is our sample. So right. this, this is not the, uh, a typical, it's, by the way, the same, uh, the same thing pertains to the NBC Survey Monkey polls. They do the same thing. Yeah, the, and, and by NBC has sur- has partnered with Survey Monkey several times this cycle, including yep. on some new polling that they just put out in the last week. So it's not it's not like we're way off on an island somewhere doing this. I just think no, but what there I think, are reasons to be skeptical. Well, I think what NBC does do with their, with their data, which we haven't done at Hot Air Town Hall, is they take the they take the data that comes in from these responses and they uh, remodel it based on uh, the demographic models that they are looking for, which you can do and which is legitimate. Uh, there are pollsters who do this, uh, especially when it comes to media pollsters, is that they'll say, well, you know, the, the, the proper, you know, the proper gender balance should be this, the proper partisan balance should be that. And you go through and you remodel the responses so that you say, okay, these responses when fit into this model would be. We're not doing that. We, we haven't done that, at least so far. Right, we, haven't, we haven't gone through and corrected for what we think the model right. ought to be. And, and if we were, for example, D plus 19 is completely ludicrous. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's way um, out there. There's no doubt about that. But, you know, this time around, the gender balance was actually pretty decent, especially in the Republican subsample. I mean, it was well, actually... Well, Repu- yeah, in the Republican sample, it was. In the overall sample, it was not. It was right. 57% female, 43% male, right. which yeah. is not reflective of of the electorate, but in the Republican sample, it was split almost evenly. And if you look at our results on the Republican side, they are not very far off from some of the polling that we've seen 
from major outlets, NBC, Wall Street Journal, uh, New York Times, CBS over the last few weeks with Ben Carson taking a slight lead nationally on the Republican yep. ballot over Donald Trump and Marco Rubio surging into third place with Trump roughly static. I mean, that is right in line with what we've seen in a lot of public polling. I, in fact, it's it's almost identical to the, to the the Washington Post, the ABC poll, the CBS poll. All of these are showing that that Carson's breaking up, and it, it, and it's also in line with what you're seeing at the RCP average. I mean, it was one of the things I, one of the first things I checked is that Trump is actually losing ground. I mean, he slipped a little bit in our series over six weeks, but it's within the margin of error. That the, the the actual move here has just been that Carson's picked up a lot more support. And what it looks like to me, Guy, and I'm interested in your take on this, is it looks like he's picking up um, the the product of the deflation of the Carly Fiorina bubble because it, it almost it almost fits exactly in uh, with what's, what's going on with Fiorina. She's declining. He's going upward. And I think he's getting the former Fiorina votes over the last six weeks. I think that's probably part of it. I think... Um... Rubio's probably getting a few of the Fiorina people. Probably Jeb folks are jumping ship and looking for someone else to I think they're going to, to Rubio. Join. I think they're I think, going a lot, to Rubio. I think a yeah. lot of them are going to Rubio, which is interesting given how hard Jeb is attacking Rubio because I think he sees, well, Jeb's attacking Rubio, Trump's attacking Rubio, the Democrats are attacking Rubio. I think that that does tell you something. Uh, there's, it does. interestingly, a, a new poll out of New Hampshire that all upon it wrote about yesterday. Um, and there was a piece I saw in the Washington post about Rubio surging into third place. And it examined some of the polling data and said, this isn't just a post debate bounce from Rubio, who I think a number of polls showed that he won the debate, including our own poll that we're discussing. Um, he about a fourth of respondents said that he won the debate, which was more than anyone else. Um, what these pollsters were saying in the Washington Post analysis said, yes, of course, Rubio has benefited from a strong debate performance, but his steady climb in the polling started in the weeks prior to the debate. Um, so he's building on something, and I'm suspecting, given uh, the decision of the Jeb campaign and the Democrats to do what they're doing, and Trump to some extent, although Trump doesn't do any internal polling, um, they recognize Rubio's building something. Now, the good news for him and also for Ted Cruz, they've, you know, they're now pretty firmly in third and fourth place. In a lot of these polls, they've broken into double digits. They're still at about half the level of support of the top two guys, Carson and Trump. You know, what I'm seeing is that basically you've got half of the electorate that's tied up. You know, in our poll, it's 45% roughly. Um, in most other polls, it's really 50%. Half of the vote's going to Trump or Carson. And it, yep. that's, that's been pretty consistent. And actually, it's even increased a little bit over the last few weeks. And then you've got, you know, 12 other candidates splitting up the other 50%. And uh, what is that? Uh, a third of that's going to either cr uh, Trump or Cruz. So, yeah, there's 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 scraps down there at, at, for most of these candidates. And, and they're... They're fighting over the scraps. But one thing that I, I did find well, interesting. Oh, go ahead, Guy. I'm sorry. I should let well, you Well, I was going to say one thing. I watched some of Trump's press conference today. I, I couldn't really watch the whole thing just because a lot of it is just the exact same stuff he's been saying for his entire campaign and lots of references to his own polling, um, accurate and inaccurate. <laughs> <laughs> um, but he, it was interesting. He was asked the question should more Republicans start to drop out of the race? And he said, yes, they should. And I thought that was interesting because, I mean, of course, him coming out and saying, yeah, you know, all these people should drop out. Of, you know, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to win. These other losers should drop out. Like, that's not unusual for him to call on people to drop out of the race. But I, I do wonder if he recognizes strategically that the more fractured the field is and the more people remain in play, the more sort of... Um, split up the remainder of the Republican electorate is, and it sort yeah. of benefits him having as many people on stage during debates, um, having as many people in the race, splitting up various constituencies, as long as he is still polling at a, you know, solid 25, 26 percent, 
I mean, it seems like it actually behooves him strategically to have as many people in the race as possible. Um, but, you know, at least for now, he's saying he wants he wants people to drop out. And it does seem a little silly that here we are in November and we still have 15 candidates. And the only person who's dropped out is, well, aside from the only people who have dropped out are Rick Perry and Scott Walker. And you still have a bunch of these absolute no chance dead end candidates, not only in it, but participating in televised debates. Yeah. Now, see, this is the thing that I'm. I mean, I kind of ranted about this with uh, Dwayne last week, is that at a certain point, you're going to have to start imposing a, like a 5% limit, right? <laughs> Just say, if you're not pulling at 5%, don't bother showing up on the stage because you've been, you've had, you've had months to, to, to garner some momentum. It's not happening. And, uh, and by the way, just to jump in, I think that, you know, when Carly objected to the debate rules, after that first round, she was well within her rights to do so because oh, sure. this, you know, this was like an opening opportunity to address people. And she worked very hard and performed very well and clearly earned the spot. But, you know, August, that makes sense. We're now in November. Those arguments no longer apply because they've all had their shot multiple times. I think right. you're right. Yeah. I, I think it's time that the problem is though, <laughs> with this, you know, candidate confab that they tried to hold and tried to kind of take control of the debate process away from the RNC, which I could have predicted was going to fail miserably because you had 14 candidate campaigns that are competing against each other. And I, I said, it's sort of like, I don't know if you've ever played diplomacy. Um, it's a great way to lose friends, by the way. The game of diplomacy is a great way to lose friends because it's all about stabbing people in the back. Essentially, that's what it comes down to. And that's what this was going to come down to. So it was no, I, I'm only surprised that it took as long as it did for Trump to come out and say, oh, I'm not going to go along with those losers. I'm doing my own thing. I can, I can manage my own deals. Let the rest of them figure out what they want to do. Um, the, 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 the point, the problem here is that when you have that going on, the RNC is going to probably step quietly now in, in trying to exercise some discipline over the the debates that are remaining. And if they start pushing people out of the race, they're going to have a whole big, huge backlash against them and are out of the debates, not out of the race, but out of the, out of the debates. So I'm not sure that they're in a position right now to step in and exercise that kind of discipline. Well, I'm also, I'm also unclear on what exactly these campaigns think they can accomplish here with this letter that they were going to send. Which, and by the way, they didn't, they didn't all sign on to it. Trump no. bailed, Carly, Carly's people were never even there. I think Christie has been sort of critical of it. So I thought that the candidates did a very good job in real time of just really aggressively counterpunching against these biased moderators and pointing out the, the nature of their questions and the gotcha games that were being played and, and the agenda that was, uh, you know, abundantly clear to anyone who was watching. They did it in real time. They, you know, they turned most of the media against CNBC. Everyone basically admitted this thing was a mess, um, you know, except for John Harwood, who was the worst violator of all of them. He's, you know, living in his, his bubble of denial because he's, you know, it's pretty clear where he's coming from. Right. But it, it seems like the candidates, by recognizing what was going on and calling it out for what it was, they dominated CNBC, like they won. So I'm not really sure what exactly, and they've, and they've put a lot of other networks on notice being like, if you guys try to go down this route, we're going to pile on you and make you look terrible. Um, so don't follow CNBC's example. I feel like that whole episode was a lot of egg on CNBC's face, but made the candidates collectively look pretty good and, and strong and, and willing to rally around each other to push back against this sort of nonsense. It seems like this whole, you know, secret meeting with demands and uh, all, all of that strikes me as almost maybe overkill. Um, and again, it doesn't look like it's necessarily going to accomplish anything because you've got people peeling off because everyone has their own discrete interests. Right. Right. Because they're all competing against each other. Right. So right. They, I mean, it's like the Articles of Confederation. It sounds great in theory. But in practice, it's a disaster. And and that's why the RNC is sort of the neutral um, 
umbrella outfit that can manage this process. And so the, the issue here isn't that the RNC screwed up. The issue is that they didn't reform the right part of the process. I mean, Priebus did a pretty good job of, of getting the debates down to a manageable level. And in, in putting together, if you take a look at what he said the agreement was with CNBC, the issue wasn't that Priebus didn't organize it properly. The, the, the issue was basically that CNBC reneged on the agreement that they had with them. And so I don't know that having, you know, 14 campaigns with 14 different sets of demands uh, for every one of these debates is necessarily going to improve things. The issue is, is that you have to get away from these game show formats and go to a format that works in a way that's going to present conservative and Republican policies in, in a in a in a fair light, right? In the right, we we you can basically say we got lucky with the Tapper CNBC debate, and I think we did probably pretty good with the Fox News debate. But the, the problem is, is that this format lends itself to the type of mischief that Harwood, Quintanilla, and Quick uh, well, and that's did. and that's the thing, like. Fox News there, the opening part of the debate process does entail, in my opinion, vetting these candidates. So asking them difficult questions about general election and primary election vulnerabilities and apostasies and that sort of thing, like that is a legitimate vein of questioning for some of these questions. And Fox had a brutal, you'll remember, this, yeah. brutal opening round of questions for mm-hmm. everyone. Well, Every so did Anderson Cooper in the Demo- that first round was really pointed and tough. But that was not the entire tone and tenor of the full debate, which is, that's the difference with CNBC. It seemed like CNBC was just two straight hours of well, and gotcha. And arguing, questions- with the, arguing with the answers, debating the, the, the candidates on the answers rather than having the candidates debate amongst themselves on the answers. Right. I mean, the whole right. thing was a disaster. It was poorly organized. There was no real thought process to, as to how the questions were going to come out. It was basically, it, it basically, it looked like they were winging it all night long. Well, and then, you know, it, it was a CNBC debate supposedly about the economy, which is their area of competence. Um, and, Instead, you had, you know, some questions, you know, you had the, uh, you know, the, the football, fantasy football question. You had a yeah. question about gay marriage hypocrisy for Ben Carson. Like, yeah, you had a couple ones that were just sort of well beyond what that debate was supposed to be. In addition to the interruptions and the argumentative exactly. nature of the questions, especially John Harwood, um, it just seemed like almost every question was loaded. Um, I agree. And it was intended to make people look bad rather than like, hey, let's let's try to elucidate some positions. And I think getting back to our poll, our town hall hot air poll, uh, some guys did better than others in navigating those waters. Yep. Uh, although I think as, as a whole, the field did pretty well. Uh, Christy, I think, had a very good debate. Um, Fiorina had a pretty good debate, I thought. You know, it's tough for her to live up to her first two. But that night when I wrote my recap, I was... I was in Boulder. To me, the obvious winners were Rubio and Cruz, and our poll certainly gave gave them both a nice little boost. With they Rubio did. being the winner, in, at least in the eyes of our respondents who watched the poll. Guy, we're going to have to leave it at that. Uh, Guy Benson, you can catch him on Fox News, where he's a regular contributor. Also at Townhall.com. Guy, thanks for being with us today. We will talk to you again soon, sir. Sounds good, Ed. Bye bye. All right, and joining us now are the folks behind Fly Girls the series. Now this is a this is a, a project that is just getting off the ground, and uh, I thought uh, looks like I hung up on them by accident. Let's go ahead and okay. Let's go ahead and bring them back in. We've got Fun. two of the three folks here. Uh, who's on the line? Hi, Ed. This is Hillary Prentice, the producer of Fly Girl. Hi, Hillary. Great to have you on. And who else do we have on the line? And Makia Carell, the creative director of Fly Girls. Flygirlstheseries.com, by the way. And uh, we're going to get into um, more of the online effort here behind Fly Girls the series. And I think we're also waiting for Jess Clackham to call in. And she's going to be calling. I, I may That may have been the person I accidentally hung hung up on i i was warning uh matia hillary and jess that um about all about open source production values here at the ed morrissey show so we're, <laughs> we're gonna work our way through those but <laughs> okay. it's but it's uh but it's great to have you on and and what a um 
interesting project uh, this is. Now, as a World War II buff to you know to to some extent i was aware of the the wasps but i i really don't know the stories behind the the women who served as pilots in uh in the u.s armed forces during world war ii and i don't think a lot of people even are aware of the fact that there were a number of women who were flying these planes flying every kind of plane that the u.s produced sometimes uh losing their life uh, working on these planes, and, and I think 38 of them lost their lives in service to their country. That's correct. And not too many people know about the uh, about these women, these remarkable women who uh, stepped up when when the men were on the front lines, and the women were taking their lives into their own hands with some of these uh, some of these uh, airplanes as well. Absolutely, you know, these planes were straight out of the factory, and we know that aviation was was what helped us win in World War II. And these women were flying, like, as you said, every type of aircraft that was invented and designed during that time. And a lot of times what these uh, these instructors or, or generals did is when the men were afraid to fly something, what they did, what they would do is try to shame them, and they would put women in the plane uh, to to take over and show the men that these planes were safe, and if a woman could fly it, then a man certainly could fly it. So it it there's there's incredible military history, aviation history, and personal stories that are really touching and moving. And one thing that I know people may know about the wasp, but I wonder if they know that 25 American women with Jackie Cochran went to England to fly for the RAF. With, with the ATA, Air Transport Auxiliary, um, before they could fly for the United States. They weren't allowed to fly yet for the United States. So 25 American women went there to prove in this experiment that they, in fact, could do this. They could ferry planes. It was, and, of course, this is the precursor to what became the Women Air Service Pilots. Women Air Service Pilots, or WASPs. Um, now, I'm, mm-hmm. I'm using WASPs with the plural because it just... It's hard to just say wasp and then and then let it be plural because that's technically the correct form. But in in conversation, it's it's difficult. So I hope you'll hope you'll forgive me if I'm saying wasps. But yeah, women <laughs> air service right. pilots, w- women air service pilots. Uh, I think people know about the waves and the wax. I don't think they know too much about the uh, wasps. Hillary, what is it that drew you to this project? Wow. Well, I was a history major at Dartmouth College, and I'm sorry, dear old Dartmouth, I did not know about the WASP. Um, I did not know about them until uh, 2012 when I first met Mattia, and we were looking at um, her version of this uh, production was actually a play, and she told a very moving story of, of putting the play on in Provincetown, Cape Cod, and um, Miss uh, B. Haydu, one of our wasps in residence, as I like to call them, are, we have we have three women um, still alive and flying who are our consultants. Um, and at the end of the play, B. came down in her uniform, and everybody in the audience. It's hard for me to talk about without even tearing up. Everybody in the audience just burst into tears and clapped and stood up and gave her a standing ovation. And it's and it's that same sense of these these women who who broke down you know these barriers who broke down every barrier a lot of women wouldn't weren't driving at this time let alone flying planes so for me they're a big source of inspiration and i think that everybody ought to know about them and uh i hope that you know we will change that with fly girls that everybody will know about these women and certainly while these women are still alive because unfortunately there's very few of them left with us today. So I, I, I would like for them to know that their legacy will be remembered. And Jess Clackham, I think is on the line with us now. And Jess is actually the one who brought this to my attention first, because Jess is sort of like all over Twitter and, uh, and, <laughs> and, uh, and, and she is, she has been a, a, a great um, ambassador, I think for this project. And, um, just what is it that uh, first off uh, explain to the folks who you are in this project and what is it that uh, brought you into this i mean what is it that that spoke to you about this well i'm the and hi everybody <laughs> i'm the director of social media and veterans liaison for the project and what brought me into this um was um i 
um, connected with Mattia um, regarding another project, and um, we had been talking about something else, and then she found out I was a veteran. We started talking, and she found out I was a veteran of the Coast Guard, and um, I sent her the website I put together uh, called Letters from Arthur, which was a site where I had transcribed the uh, World War II letters of my grandfather's twin brother who had died in the Pacific. And I put those letters out there along with photos and did, because I also studied history, like, like Hillary, and I love history, so I went out and did a historical perspective um, that went along with each letter so that when people read the letters, they could get a better understanding of what was going on at the time. And she loved that, and one thing led to another, and she sent me the promo trailer, and I cried <laughs> the first time I saw it, and every time after that for a long time, um, because it's so moving, and that was it. So That's you're, you're what hooked. did it. You're hooked. All three of you are hooked on this story. I mean, the passion really <laughs> comes through in this. The passion comes through in the promotional trailer. If you, By the way, folks who are, who are watching this, if you haven't seen the promotional trailer, it is embedded in today's show post, and it will stay there. Uh, so be sure to check that out. It is really it's a it's a it's a wonderful um, two and a half minute look at um, at the history here. Uh, obviously, so much more to talk about, but it really gives you a flavor of these stories that are have not been told and need to be told. And you know, Mattia, we we hear this. This has been coming up over the years, right? You had the Navajo Code Talkers whose story didn't get told for something like forty mm -hmm. years until digital cryptography really. Uh, eliminated the need for uh, Navajo code uh, for national mm -hmm. security. Uh, those 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 veterans, some of whom passed away before they got recognized, spent you know four decades without being able to talk right. about how they contributed to the war effort. Uh, you, you, right. You, you 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 hear these stories coming up from the greatest generation, and and I think that. We, we, you know, we've heard the stories about Rosie the Riveter. I mean, obviously, that's something that's been told for you know, and and, and well told in in mm -hmm. movies like Swing Shift. I'm sure all three of you have seen the movie Swing Shift with Goldie Hawn and uh, other movies of that type that that talk about all the difficulties that you know women had in transitioning both into the workforce and then more or less being forced out of the workforce <laughs> after the war. Um, th those are the types of stories that that have been told. This story has not been told. And Mattia, why do you think that this story has taken so long to come to the attention of uh, of Hollywood or, or you know, pretty much any any other place that tells these stories? Well, that's a, that's a great that's a great question, and it, it's a hard one to answer. And I think I mean I've been doing this for twenty years. I did uh, create a feature film. Uh, many years ago, but at that time, the idea of an all-female cast or the majority of cast being female was, was I think, frightening <laughs> to studio heads. And it's, it's a shame because either they treat women's stories as little, quaint little films, you know, sort of like a, a masterpiece veneer over it, and... Also, there's the other part. Let's uh, put, I won't put all the blame on the studios and networks for lack of imagination, but the, the, the women themselves were more reticent after the war. They didn't want to overshadow their husbands or their husbands' contributions to the war effort. So when I started my research, maybe there was a handful of books or memoirs. Now there's, there's, there's maybe hundreds of these memoirs that are out there. And now, of course, the timing is so right. There's a huge movement in Hollywood about putting the mes message out there that we need more women's stories, more women in front of the camera, more women behind the camera. And the only way that it's going to happen is if we as women push, create these stories. Because, and this is not disrespectful to any man, but it's our responsibility in a way to, to, make, to create this story and get it out there. And I think our timing is exactly right now. People are ready. You know, Mattia, I'm going to come back to you for this question, too. I mean, you talk about a lack of imagination in Hollywood, you know, and uh, golly, I, I, I've, I've got my plans to go see Fast and Furious 7, uh, so I don't know what you mean about <laughs> lack of imagination. I'm just... Maybe maybe that's too much of a zinger. I, I should I probably should back off for that. But but I mean, I mean that's that's a common complaint is that there 
is that you don't see a lot of original programming <laughs> ideas coming out of Hollywood these days. And this is, I right. mean, I, th this is a story that just, it, it, it seems made for a, uh, for a mini series. In fact, you know, it is because HBO had a very successful mini series that was similar right. to this, which was band of brothers. The, the, the story That's of correct. E company in world war two, uh, from, from D day till, uh, uh, till the end of, uh, world war two. And, and, you you'd think with that kind of success, married to really a a, a very unique storyline, that there would be a lot of you know, the people be beating down your door. We're going to get to how we're going to make them beat down your door in just a moment. But I, I mean, are you surprised that this story? I mean, now that you have hundreds of books out there, you guys have been talking about it. You did a play about this. Uh, by the way, I should I should also mention by the way that Mattia is an you know Oscar nominated <laughs> short film a short film filmmaker and so it's it's not like you're breaking into the biz here you know <laughs> you're you're right a quantity. right right no it, it's true I've worked in the industry many years and I've done a uh, two independent features and yeah. television uh, I think the time you brought up a very good point Ed because it's television now because there's so many different platforms out there it's made room for women's stories and if the british have done anything they have proven that world war ii stories that are centered around women like home fires bletchley circle there there they there is an audience for them sure and and i think that's what's happened now tv has opened up uh the arena for more miniseries uh that are historical fiction um so I, I think that's that's the other thing that's happened. So all right, so Hillary, let, let's go to you with this. Um, obviously, great story needs to be told. You guys are on this. You want to make a ten part miniseries uh, based on the based on the stories of the women that actually you know flew in this service and very very much focused on them. Um, you also want to make sure that that's the story that gets told. So. You guys are, are working hard to make sure that you retain control of this. Um, that's where that's where the 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 project plan comes into place. And one of the things that we're here to discuss is the crowdfunding that you want to do to get this project off the ground so that you can stay in control of it, uh, but but get it going. So tell us a little bit about the um, about the crowdfunding project and how people can help out with this. Sure. Thank you, Ed. Um, the crowdfunding does two things. Number one, it demonstrates that we have an audience, that we have support. So something that we say on our Facebook and Twitter is that even if you have a dollar, uh, one dollar does a lot because, you know, right now, I think we have last time I checked before we got on the air, we have 132 contributors after our first week which I think is really great. And we have now over 5,000, about 5,200 fans on Facebook. So if each one of those Facebook fans gave, you know, $8 or $7, something like that, we would be more than funded. And that would be so powerful to have our fans to have 5,000 contributors. I mean, that's that would be amazing. I would much prefer that over somebody coming in you know, a couple people coming in and making up the difference right now. Um, and partly what we're doing w with the crowdfunding, besides demonstrating that we have an audience, is starting our capital so that we can actually go out and hire the writers ourselves. And we're in talks with some very prominent British writers right now. We'd like to have a British writer and an American writer on, on the pilot, at least, because the pilot does take place over in England, um, as we've said. Right. And because it is a 10-part miniseries, um, there is an enormous amount of, of room to really go big. It's kind of like go big or go home. We're going epic here, Ed. We're going to include women who flew from different countries. There were at least 32 different countries that were flying that had women representatives that were flying for the ATA. And, and then, of course, you have the women who were in France, the American women who were helping in France and the images of them, of these squares filled with women in military uniform. It, it just, it's stunning. And we do not have images 
like this. We do not see this on TV and we do not see this in film. And partly why we want to retain control is to make sure that those images are there. You know, um, we don't want, um, we don't want to shy away from women's participation in the military in in combat type situations or where there, you know, there might be bombs falling or, or, you know, shells falling. Um, women traditionally have not been shown in those types of situations in military right. films. Traditionally they are, you know, the wives who are at home and they are the nurses, um, you know, in the hospitals and not that those roles aren't amazing and that those, those women didn't do an incredible service, but we want to do something different. And I believe that in, in telling the, this story, not only will it, it um, serve, you know, the, the 120 or so wasps who are still alive, uh, there are also women in the ATA, um, you know, it will show them that we remember them. It will also do so much for the young women and men of today looking at women in these roles. And I think it will help our, our, um, our armed forces, our armed forces today. Um, so... Uh, the, the crowdfunding is incredibly important for starting us on this journey and for maintaining the integrity of the project. And, you know, like I said, any, any amount, any contribution, right. <laughs> um, is, is, goes, goes a long, goes a long way. Well, we, 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 we've, we've had this discussion, by the way, uh, for those of you who are watching the show and remember this, we've had this discussion with Phelan McAleer, uh, who crowdfunded, uh, two of his films. And he said the exact same thing in order to get people to take you seriously, you have to show that there's a fairly broad, uh, base of support. And that's the reason why just kicking in a dollar is much more valuable than you than you'd otherwise think. Now, uh, Jess, I'm going to turn to you here since you're the um, director of social media for this project. You know the pressure's on here, right? I mean, you <laughs> you you, you got to get this thing. I, I don't want to I don't want to freak you out, but the pressure's on, right? You you got to get this thing going. I'm freaking out. No, <laughs> it is the, the pressure is on. We work very hard every day to do this, but. I love this. This is my, I love reaching out to people and networking. I'm good at it. I love people. And I just am able to, we each bring something very unique to the project. And um, one thing that we, one of the things that we all have in common is passion for it. And you have to have that to really engage people on social media. They need to not only they need to feel it when they're reading your tweets and when they're reading your posts on Facebook. They need to feel it, and they do. And I, I really enjoy it. Um, it's really a second full-time job. <laughs> it's, you, you eat, sleep, dream um, this project. And um, people won't donate or they won't be interested if we're not passionate about it, and, that, and we are. And... Like Carrie said, I mean, we have we have so many people on our Facebook, and we're gaining Twitter followers. We're getting retweets all the time. We we have thousands of comments and thousands of uh, likes and shares and emails coming in. I mean, the numbers now. I was thinking about this today that this the social media campaign has just taken on a life of its own. The momentum is yep. incredible. The numbers won't dwindle they're only going up every day people are talking about this every day that's great it's really amazing and and by the way um, what just could i'm sorry what just could use is is some is some uh partners in that uh, in that diplomacy for fly girls so if you're if you're not following jess uh, and and she's pretty easy to follow at jessica clackham um you, you can you can follow along you can retweet her you can engage on the facebook page the link that link is in the show post and i cut somebody off i don't know who i cut off but go ahead oh i was just going to jump in and this is hillary i was just going to jump in and say that one of the things that i love about our facebook pages and and our twitter feed um is that it's also becoming a platform for women in the military, um, mostly, you know, recent veterans um, to come forth and share photos of themselves in uniform and also their stories. And we've even had some women from the UK reach out to us. And believe it or not, over in the UK, they engage in, in World War II reenactments, including dressing up as our wasps. So wow. UK women celebrating the wasp in World War II reenactments, and they've sent us photos 
and we've posted them on our page. We also get photos and stories from children of the WASP, and we've had a number of contributions from WASP children. And that makes us uh, just, it's so gratifying, I can't even tell you. And they've been waiting for these stories of their mothers to be told. So and they that's should what be we're told. doing. And they should be told. I mean, I think this is a great project. Uh, I can't wait to, to for it to to hit the hit the television screens and one platform or another, so that we can all find out a little bit more about the uh, women air, air service pilots and and the contribution, the significant contribution they made to uh, to to victory in World War II. Uh, I think these stories are marvelous, and I, I think that the um, you know we we haven't finished plumbing all of the all of the nuances of what that massive commitment to uh, to to freedom and victory uh, was in the uh, you know late 1930s and early 1940s amongst us and our allies, and this to me seems like a very large piece that has just never been told. And I, I have to tell you, I think it's uh, I think it's a wonderful project, and I, I'm wishing you all the best of luck on this. Uh, and I'd like to keep checking in with you to see how things are going and, and, and to push this. But for right now, we need to get the crowdfunding going. The link for the crowdfunding is in the show post. Um, Mattia, why don't you remind people where that crowdfunding project is? I'd say maybe Mattia is, is, is off the line. Uh, Hillary, uh, uh, where is that crowdfunding project located at? Oh sure, um, Mattia, you might have put put him on mute by accident. Sorry, I, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, that's okay. Sorry. A lot of people put me on mute, Mattia. I mean, that's nothing new. <laughs> <laughs> Time to shut up the director. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's nothing new. <laughs> um, Ed, we're on Fun Dreamer. Um, Mattia was at the DGA for a, a crowdfunding seminar actually before we went and, and started this endeavor, and um, a CEO of Fun Dreamer found out about Matias project and uh, absolutely loves it like we all do. And so uh, we are on their platform and you can find us at fundreamer.com forward slash uh, fly girls, the series. And of course there's a fly girls, the series.com website, which will direct you to the crowdfunding as well. The links are in the show That's post, right. including the Facebook page. The links are in the show post. I encourage people right. to, to follow that. I don't have uh, just Clackham's, um, Twitter handle in the in the show post, but it's at Jessica Clackham. And if you just look at my my Twitter feed, I've been retweeting Jessica all day long. <laughs> so, <laughs> Thank you. Well, find it. Well, you do that all the time. Well, well, that's because you've been retweeting me all day long. So it's kind of like this, I do. It's this mutual admiration society that this this is Twitter in a nutshell, right? So we just retweet each other. All day long. <laughs> this is how it works. This is how exactly how it works. <laughs> So, yeah, be sure to follow Jessica. Be sure to get on the Facebook page. Be sure to, if even if it's a dollar, hit that uh, crowdfunding page and and push this project closer to uh, closer to reality, closer to victory for the women who served in the in the wasps. And uh, hey, Ed, yes, I wanted to add one more thing if I could. Absolutely. Um, I, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt, but I I wanted to know also if we could throw the Fly Girl series Twitter handle out there as well. Oh yeah, absolutely. What is the Fly Girl series uh, Twitter handle? It is Fly Girl Series. Fly Girl Series. Uh, is Make that... sure, sure they can follow me, but we'd love if they follow Fly Girls because we keep that updated constantly. There you go, Fly Girl Series. And uh, if you go and check out uh, Jessica's Twitter feed, I'm sure you'll find it there as well, uh, <laughs> along with everybody else's, along with everybody else's tweets. She's good at this, by the way. She's really good at this, and uh, and and she talks about transmitting a sense of excitement. I got that immediately from uh, interacting with Jess on Twitter. So, uh, which is the reason why we're doing this because I'm I'm excited about this project. I want to see it become a reality. Um, Mattia Carroll, H Hillary Prentice, and Jess Clackham, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you, Fred. Thank, so thank you so much for giving us your time. My pleasure. Thank we'll, you. Ed. We'll talk to you again soon. Take, Take care. care. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. All right. I want to thank Hillary, uh, uh, Mattia, and Jess for coming on and discussing this because I, I got to tell you, I mean, there's <clears throat> that I, I'm a buff of, of history and, and World War II and 20th century history in particular. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so this is to me sort of like, you know, kid in a candy store type of stuff. I can't wait to hear these stories. I can't wait to see how this unfolds. And, and they're, this group of women are very, very committed to making sure that these stories get on the screen in the right way. And so, excuse me, I think that uh, 
this is a project that we can all get behind. We've done it before. We did it for Phelan McAleer and Ann McElhaney. We've done it a couple times for them. We can do it for uh, Fly Girls, too, I think, and, and the women who served in the Wasps. Uh, I think it's fantastic, and I'm looking forward to it. All right, I want to thank everybody who's been on the show today. Guy Benson, of course, who I had to kick off because the other people were coming in. <laughs> Excuse me. Andrew Malcolm, who I had to interrupt because... I screwed up the software somehow on the show. So it's been a whole day of open source production values here at the Ed Morrissey Show. Who knew? That never happens here. <laughs> Thursday, we're going to come back for more with Dwayne Generalissimo Patterson of the Hugh Hewitt Show. We're also going to talk, I think I mentioned, <laughs> I mentioned uh, the Navajo Code Talkers as uh, part of... Um, as part of, you know, the, the type of thing that you didn't hear much about until decades after the war was over. But um, I think we're going to try to get um, a, a member of the uh, Navajo Nation to come on and talk about the EPA and the, and the mine spill and how it's impacted their, um, how it's impacted their, um, their land and, and their, and their way of life down there. This is the, the Gold King uh, mine spill in Colorado that uh, dumped all the, uh, dumped that horrible <laughs> pent up uh, toxic waste into the Navajo's water. And uh, so we're going to talk to them about that and about uh, EPA and, and how they operate on Thursday. We're also going to talk, uh, and this is all coming together to Sue Ellen Browder, who wrote a book called subverted about the women's movement and how it was, um, and how it was kind of co-opted by the hard left and uh, turned into something that it wasn't really intended to be and how she kind of got duped into it. So that'll, that'll be an interesting story. I'm looking forward to uh, talking with her, talking with the Navajo Nation uh, representative, as well as Dwayne Patterson, as usual, 4 p.m. Eastern time, 3 p.m. Central, one on the left coast. Um, uh, <laughs> I just happened to catch something in the, in the, in the, in the chat room. Um, and all I saw at first was, you don't think Ed could make a pretty girl? Um, no. <laughs> no, I, I am not trying out <laughs> for a role on Fly Girls. <laughs> no, I, I think that would be a bad idea. I'm happy to be a viewer of Fly Girls when it hits the when it hits the screens. But yeah, no, I, I don't think anybody wants me as a as a woman pilot in the, in the 1940s. That would just not would not be prudent. Not going to go there. <laughs> See, this is the thing. You turn around, you look at the chat room, and all of a sudden you've broken out all of the context of the stuff that you were talking about. We'll be back, though, on Thursday, 4 p.m. Eastern Time, 3 p.m. Central. 4 p.m. Eastern Time, 3 p.m. Central, one on the left coast. I want to thank the folks in the chat room who are, um, who've are been patient today. <laughs> With uh, all of the goofy, all the goofiness that has gone on in today's uh, Ed Morrissey show, Cranky T Rex, of course, the guy who runs the chat room every single show at Cranky T Rex on Twitter, Cranky T Rex .com is where he blogs, Buzzbo.com is where he writes, and occasionally at hotair.com as well. Monster is back with us, and it's always great to have the monster back uh, at Sum Ergo Monstro on Twitter. Uh, e3gazette.blogspot.com is his blog now. So uh, be sure to check that out as well. Don't forget to put your own URLs up in the chat room. We're all about shameless blog promotion here at the Ed Morrissey Show, as well as doing some walking music here so that we can... Uh... <laughs> Let's see if I can keep this from getting screwed up. <clears throat> I don't know if that's the case, but we'll give it a try. Welcome to the chat room. Let's go ahead and run down the list. We've got Rick Nichols, one of the fabulous triples in the Hugh Crew Cruise Cruise Mate. Conservative the Liberal Hands, Juanito Cabron, Mr. Fastbucks, another one of the fabulous triples. The Hugh Hewitt Show, by the way, starts in a half hour. You can watch it at the Hughiverse, H U G H N I V E R S E dot com. The troll free web surfing experience for Hugh Hewitt fans. I am a list. I am a excuse me, I'm a member. You should be a member as well. My sister's brother, Prairie Dog SD. Say hi to Mrs. Prairie Dog for me. Scoot65, T-Ran, Via Paso with the Ancestral Morrissey Mons. And the first mate behind me keeping me on the straight and narrow. The narrow. All right, folks, don't forget, Thursday, 4 p.m. Eastern Time, 3 p.m. Central, one on the left coast. Don't miss a minute of the Ed Morrissey Show. We'll see you later.